please join me in giving a warm Notre Dame welcome to Tom Brown and Michael Haney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think they, it's, it's said it all. <laughs> Our master plan has worked. <laughs> Yeah. 30 whatever years later. Tom and I have right. dreamed about this. We've talked about this for many dinners, how great it would be to come back yeah. and share, especially yeah. Tom's story. Um, and we're excited to do it. And you saw a little bit of the sizzle, yeah. as we call it in the business. Now we're going to get to the steak. <laughs> now, when Megan approached me initially with coming back, I thought I didn't have to think very, very long and hard because I know that when we were at school, I would have killed to have somebody come and hear a story that was inspiring in a way that I knew when I was here, I had no clue what my plan was, what I wanted to do. And to know that you don't have to know what your, your plan is right now, but 34 years later, it can happen. So as long as you keep your mind open to being able to experience life and to really just let, you know, I think life is such an amazing um, teacher and letting life really bring you to where you are supposed to be. Perfect transition. So let's talk quickly about your life. A good boy from Allentown, PA, comes to Notre Dame. Why Notre Dame? I. You know, my sister's here, and we loved our parents so much, and my father went here. And so we all, it was always, all, as a lot of us here at Notre Dame, if we had a parent, it was usually top of the list. And so it was as easy as that. I came here because my, my father came here. And I lived in my father's dorm, and, you know, so it was, it was part of our, you know, our growing up. Right. And so, as I said a moment ago, you saw the kind of highlights, the life after this. I always want to move quickly through the life before that. You graduate 88. You have aspirations to be an actor. You go to L.A. Somewhere, from what I remember you've told me, there's a Motrin commercial that might include a still of you. Um, yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I left I. Graduated, I had a consulting job and I hated it. Six months into it, I called my father and I said, Dad, I hate this. And he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I'm going to quit and I don't know what I'm going to do. But I knew that this wasn't what I sh should be doing. And I, this is why I say, like, you have to just follow your instinct and find, find really what you should be doing in life. And so I... Moved out to LA, and LA is is so seductive in regards to doing not very much. <laughs> so, um, but I did a lot of little things, you know. And yes, I did try to act some, but I was, I guess, I was horrible because I didn't really get any jobs. Um, and five years later, I was, I really was, really, nothing was really happening. I had no money. And I sold my station wagon to move back to New York to really start, you know, being a little bit more serious about what I should be doing. And, you know, I was playing a little bit with vintage clothing out in L.A. with a good friend of mine who has a collection out in L.A. and uh, really successful and started his collection earlier than mine. And so I moved back and I just got a job. You got a job at, uh, first it was Armani, yeah. running a showroom where a lovely girl showed up. Someday. Yeah. I uh, met your, your wife. My, my, not, I didn't even know my wife. Yeah. Brooke used to call on Tom. This is Armani Rupp. Then he worked, worked at Club Monaco doing designs. And, but you were, and then we come sort of soon after that to a moment I call the vision, right? Yeah. Where all of a sudden, you have the vision of what you want to do with a gray suit. Mm -hmm. And 
I just want to take us back to how that came and what you saw. And then I want to unpack a little bit about how the gray suit became the foundation of this empire. So why the suit and, and, and what, what, what made you think I can do something with this? I mean, for me, I didn't overthink it. I, it was something that I wanted for myself. And, and it really didn't start with my own collection. It started actually in LA when I used to cut vintage you know, suits down to pretty much the same proportion. And then I moved to New York and worked for George Armani. And Mr. Armani probably would have hated the way I wore the suits because I was the only one that bought the 46 shorts. And so I shortened even Mr. Romani's suits. And then with Ralph, I learned, you know, Ralph is the most generous and the, the power that Ralph Lauren has is to be able to see somebody's, I think their passion in moving into something that he sees in them. Mm -hmm. And so he moved me into design and I was even doing this at, when I was at Club Monaco and couldn't give the stuff away. Um, and then I thought like, but I really, really love what it is. So I quit and I went out on my own. And, and for me, it was just, if I was gonna do it, I wanted to do something that the last thing the world needed was another designer or somebody, you know, another person making clothing. So I wanted to do something that really meant something and was going to be the reason why maybe 50 years later people would have really remember what I did. Because I, I do feel like speaking to the gray suit, I feel like the most important designers over the last um, hundred years, you have, a, you have an image in your head when you think of who they are. And that for me was that gray suit, which we all you know, had, a, we all grew up with parents or, people that usually wore that gray suit to work. And I wanted to take that very mundane idea and give it back to people in a way that it wasn't, it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 20 years later, it's, I build every collection on that idea. Well, because you've, 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 when we've spoken just casually in the past, I mean, you make your allusions to designers who've had that impact and people like Coco Chanel, you know, who took a suit and, made people see it differently. Mr. Armani, who, you know, in the 70s, late, early 80s, completely shifted where the suit is, and then you came along and saw it. Yeah. And, but you, I mean, what, what, what I think people always find fascinating is like, this, here's Tom, very quiet, proper person, and yet you, 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 you did what great artists do. You made all of us re-see re something and see, and question proportion and, and how it fits and, and educated our eyes in an entirely different way. Um, however, but before that, it was, it was a struggle. I mean, you, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that because I think, again, when you and I have spoken and one of the things that's very important to you is it's not overnight. And here was Tom literally living in your apartment, but you were selling clothes out and you would walk the streets of New York. You laughed at. Not, not only getting laughed at for you, yeah. but also people would see you and said, nice suit. You want to buy one? Come to my apartment and I'll sell you one, right? I mean, yeah. so tell us about, that's really hustle and that's really believing in the yeah. vision, right? Yeah. I mean, if you want to do something, you have to make it happen. You really have to do it on your own and you cannot rely on you know, anything externally help. Yes, you, they can help, but if you really want it to happen, you have to make sure that you you are passionate enough about it and you love it more than anyone else in the world. And for me, it was that because it took it took three or four years for it really to be seen by people. And I'm not joking about, and you know, it still happens to this day. People see, you know, what it is. And in a way, I love it because it still provokes that conversation and it still gets people to, you know, roll their eyes. And, um, and I love that. I wanted to do something that did start a conversation like that. And I think if you want to do something important, you have to expect that it's, it's going to be almost something that people really hate at the beginning. 
And then you have to then love it so much that you could care less what anybody says. And you still are driven to make sure that eventually, it still might not be for them, but it is still pure to what you want people to see, that people understand why you're doing it. And it's so authentic to yourself that, okay, now I get it. And, you know, so. Well, I want to just, because you also said something a minute before that, which I want to, I think it's important for students to hear it and anyone else, but because it's another point you've stressed across the decades in conversation in that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you said you didn't want to do anything just to do it, right? And that's part of, I think, the Tom mindset and the Tom philosophy, I'd say, is which is, I'm not just going to become a designer to become a designer. I want to yeah. Yeah. truly change how people see something, right? Yeah, I wanted to be known for the work that I do. I, I really wasn't interested in people knowing me as the, the person. I wanted to do something that the work was what was interesting to people because I'm not that interesting really. So I think it's more interesting for people to, to put ideas and to tell stories to people that are really interesting. And you know, I'm just the one that creates it, but you don't need to know me. And I think nowadays there's too much of a preoccupation of wanting to be known and in a way be famous or to be rich. And if you're doing anything for those for those ends, I think it's gonna be hard because I think most people that you know really well and are famous, and I say most because you know there are some that are exceptions, um, you know them because they're really good at what they do. So they're really known for their work, and then through their work they become you know, a, a celebrity or they become a public figure. But before that comes the work and becomes and the hard work, and it, it's a lot of hard work. And, but you have to love it enough that it's worth it. And you have to expect that maybe it won't work out because in a lot of cases it might not. But if you're doing something that you love so much, it, won't, it, it will be the furthest thing from failure if, you're, if it doesn't work out in, in the way that you think it should or wanted it to. And then on top of that, you know, success, I think, isn't, you know, isn't the measure of money or fame. It's really, it's a measure on just doing something really well. Yeah. And I, I, I whenever I hear you talk about on, on this theme, these themes, I think it's so important because, you know, I'm, like you, I mean, many people are like, must be great to be Tom, right? And, and, <laughs> and they don't see the incredible hard work that you put into it. And, you know, just for example, how many collections a year now are you designing? Well, now I do, you know, two for men's, two for women's, and then also, you know, more commercial collections for men's and women's, you know, four times a year. Right. So that's eight, yeah. which is, it never stops, right? And so yeah. it's, and then it's, hey, what do you got that's new, right? So there's this incredible work ethic that I think you have. And before I get to the sort of like high moments, that's why I think it's so valuable for people in the audience to hear the distance you've traveled and the the, the true work ethic you have. Because um, you, you've talked quite a bit about that and, and I think it's so um, instructive for people. But one thing, um, you know, you, you've talked about the, um, and I don't think I'm giving anything away, which is, you know, how close you've come at different times to losing the company, yeah. to closing the doors. Yeah. I think it's important that people know specifically how close it was. Right. And, and I think because, yeah. again, people think, wow, so let me, let me get this straight. Like, you, anyone can become a fashion designer and and be seen swanning around the world in Paris and with celebrities. And, yeah. But underneath that, it's not just the hard work, but, yeah. you know, as Brooke and I have said numerous times, we can remember at least two, three dinners yeah. where you're like, if I don't get money by Monday, yeah. it's over. Yeah, I mean, I was, in 2009, I was, you know, days away from going out of business. And, 
you know, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. You know, I had a lot of good, you know, you know, somewhat respected business people that, you know, advised me to just declare bankruptcy and, and start over. And the one thing that they didn't understand is like, I could not do this again. There was so much emotion and so much time and so much energy that went into it. I just couldn't do it again. On top of the fact that like all of it would have then been given away. Mm-hmm. All the work of the last, you know, you know, seven years. So I, I made it happen that I was on a plane to Japan with, you know, in the next couple of days, and I, it was important enough for me to stay going, and so I gave up a little bit of the company for some money to keep it going, and you know, but I really lucked out too in regards to the those partners that I had before, you know, my partner now who is this, you know, really very honorable, beautiful Italian family. Um, I lucked out because they were so generous in regards to just letting me do what I do. And that is, I think, because the work that I put in at the beginning was so clear and so focused that there was, there was power in that, that they knew that I, I couldn't do something that, was, that took away from what I had done. But well, that but was fortunate. Yeah, and well, let's just pause on that for a second because I think it's that's what I would call the craftsmanship. That is, in you know, again, you when you started off, you've talked about in the past how it wasn't just going to be whip it together. It was, and I think that's what I hope everyone can eventually do is see one of your pieces up close and see the yeah. incredible because you had a man named Rocco who was your. Yeah godfather in this yeah. truly and can, can you just talk about what was the artistry inside the suits and when and, and why when you went to backers they knew this was this was not just something that's temporary this is for all time yeah i mean there's a lot in in fashion that is just fluff and it's just it, it, it doesn't mean that much for me the most fashionable thing about what i do is and what i learned through um rocco was the most beautifully made pieces of clothing. And for me, I thought that is probably the most important thing I do in fashion, is the quality in what it is. And as conceptual as an idea is in what people see in my shows, I would never compromise the idea of making it as beautifully as Rocco would approve of. And so for me, it was the combination of I had this very classic idea that I was playing with and was reintroducing in an interesting way. But then I also surrounded it by these conceptual ideas that you know, made this gray suit more interesting every couple months. And I think so it was the combination of the two. And I do really split myself in half in regards to, uh, I know what's going on with the business and I'm very, I'm, I understand how that needs to work. Mm-hmm. But I also know that is important because it needs to fund the conceptual side because the conceptual side is so important to make the commercial side interesting to people. And the most important thing for me is, and especially as an American designer, is to introduce a business here in America that can be both conceptual and commercially viable. Explain what you mean by conceptual, because, I mean, the artistry, the creativity, the shows, the whole package, right, which is just, um, which I'm going to get to in a moment, because I think it's an important part of what you do, and it's incredibly important, but uh, I want to I also just pause for a second before we move there about, what did you, in, in the moments, those times when you almost lost the company, what did you learn about yourself? Uh, I'm stubborn. Um, I don't know. I just learned that, you know, I had to figure it out. And uh, I didn't think really past just, you know, I just making it happen. 
So what did I learn about myself? I just, you know, I think the one thing that I, you know, me and my sister and my brothers and sisters learned from my parents is like, you know, you have to really work hard, but just make sure you do something that's important and, and try to do it really well. And that's, you know, it's kind of, I don't know if I learned, you know, specifically about myself in that regards at that moment, but I knew that I was doing something that I really didn't want to go away. So I guess you know, it, maybe the competitive side of me came in, the swimming, the years of swimming came in, kicked in, and, you know, the, the rigor and tenacity of just maybe a little bit of the athlete came in. Yeah. I've told you this across the years, but <clears throat> what, and what I always tell people about, what I've learned from watching you is your and why you're such an inspiration to me and many people is you have never, ever compromised across 20 years for a day on your vision. Would that be accurate to say? Yeah. Uncompromised. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I feel like if, if I don't live it, you know, 24-7 and fully, 100%, then why would I expect anybody else? So, yeah, I've been very, you know, really rigorous in regards to keeping it, like, really um, focused. So let's, let's then shift for a second to the artistry and, the, and, and, and that piece of it. Um, and let's also just puncture a quick illusion that people have about designers. Can Tom Brown sketch? No. <laughs> no, I, I, I can. I, but my sketches are more conceptual and more almost Bauhausian right. in a way. Um, so I, and this is a perfect time to, to recognize I do have the most amazing team. I have the most amazing designers who, you know, get to know me well enough that even in my cryptic way, they understand um, what what I'm trying to say, even if I can't say it, you know, that well, but we get to know each other so well that it, it works. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important because design is such a collaborative endeavor that, you know, sometimes you do feel selfish when, you know, you become just known for, you, you know, what you do when in fact you have, or you, hopefully you have really good people that you really make most of it happen. They do, and, and, and it is an incredible team, but I wanna just hold here for a moment because I think, you know, for many people, they see fashion and they don't, like, how does this all happen? And if you could take us inside a little bit, hey, where do you get the ideas? How long does that take? Mm -hmm. What does it look like? So, where do you get the ideas? <laughs> How do they come, yeah. and, and, and how do you build them out? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it happens differently all the time. You know, there's never one way, but it, it, you know, it can come from just a really simple, sophomoric, you know, idea of something, and then it's a, a, a more of a conversation with my team in regards to, you know, where it could go and, like, how big it could be. But there's, like, a, a clear, like, idea at the beginning and <clears throat> I don't work like other designers in regards to researching that much or referencing that much. Of course, you know, I do reference things, but I, I wanna make sure that all of us forget enough about that reference that we can make it our own. Mm -hmm. Because I think that is an easy trap to fall into, is like when you see somebody's collection and you see the reference so heavy-handedly, it, for me, I don't think it's, it's that powerful. And, but the most important thing is like almost closing our eyes and thinking of something interesting and thinking of something that is funny, is entertaining, is ridiculous, and then you know working into how it could become something that is worthy of the six months that it takes to to make happen. Do you ever panic um, that you don't have an idea? I. I said this this morning. When I first started, yeah, I was like a flood of ideas, so many ideas. 20 years in, yeah, there there would become like dry days. <laughs> <laughs> and so as, you know, because over the years, we've done so many different things. And I think there have been really interesting ideas. And 
you know, I don't want to just do something. I really want to make sure that it's worth our time. Right. Um, so it, it, it always happens. It always happens, and sometimes it's sooner rather than later, but it always happens. I'll get to this in a minute because we'll show some images, but before that, because your show is, you know, some people just send clothes down a runway and that's enough for them. You always, as many people have said, create fashion that is then inside an art installation almost. Mm -hmm. It's very important to you, right, to, to, to have art, to be, have the whole thing seen as an artwork, right? Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I mean, simplistically, I like to just entertain. You know, I like it to be something that, you know, for 20 minutes, it tells a story and is entertaining. But I do, you know, more importantly, I do like to create something that, you know, hopefully transcends fashion in a way and isn't just about the clothes. Um, the clothing and what they, the collections and how it's made is really, really important. But the side of contextualizing it in an interesting way is really important. And um, so it's, I want it to be more than just about fashion. Yeah, no, they're, they're performance pieces within at three dimensional levels. And yeah. I think that's what, if any of you have never, you can see many of these shows online and even that doesn't do it justice, but to yeah. see the, the artistry and then the, yeah. all this world brought to life. But even, you know, the, the way that we go to work every, way, every day too, I think in a way, I do want people to understand that it's more than just dressing a certain way. Um, it's, I want it to almost be a piece of living art. That when you see it out on the street, it, 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 there's so much more to what you're seeing than just somebody in a piece of, in gray tailoring. That I want it to be, you know, have that, like, that thing that's more important than just the clothing that you're seeing. I think it's a great description of it because I think when you do see it out on the street, when you do see it, or even on a runway, it's some, some of these pieces are like a statue just became three-dimensional and started moving, right? Or a Mondrian painting came to life, you know? So it's, it's quite powerful. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to do something that's more interesting than just seeing clothing. Um, and I think, you know, it is what I, I think we challenge, we always challenge ourselves to, you know, do something more than just make clothes. Yeah. I want to maybe just at this point run through a few images and we can, that get to illustrate some of what we've got. Um, just see here. This is one that was shot early on with you guys, right? That was the beginning, yeah. <laughs> that was an image building. Image. That was, for me... Were you faking it until you made it there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, this was an image that, you know, because I was part of um, the CFDA and Vogue have a fund every year that, you know, um, really celebrates young designers. And I was part of that fund, and they, you know, very generously give you a page in, or, or two pages in Vogue and say, like, okay, what do you want to do? And I thought, this is, this is exactly what I thought of. I, what I wanted people to see at that moment was being on Park Avenue on a 65, I think, Lincoln Continental with suicide doors, and the idea of on Park Avenue, you everyone has seen, you know, thousands of, you know, men and women in very classic tailoring, but this was my reintro reintroduction of that tailoring to people. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, tell us about, this is David Bowie. Yeah. This was a moment that changed your life, right? Well, I think it would have changed anybody's life. And, yeah. <laughs> but, he, he came into my, I was in a little studio on, in the meatpacking area. And Tom had a tiny store, no customers. Yeah. You used to lock the door and hide under the register because you were <laughs> yeah. too scared, right? If I didn't feel like seeing anybody, I wouldn't <laughs> answer the door. Uh, um, but I started there and I had, you know, that's where it started in regards to really just making clothing specifically for people. And I, I don't actually remember if I got 
a call prior to his arrival, but I remember just, I, I basically couldn't stop shaking. I was so nervous, and he was the most gentle, beautiful person and was so generous, and he, I'm sure he was used to people being nervous around him, but I was nervous, and, and then he, you know, I, I asked him, you know, because he, you know, truly is one of the most important, you know, style icons of the last, you know, 100 years. So I asked him what he wanted, and he said, I think I would like something like you're wearing. I was like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> You've come to the right place. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't having somebody saying, like, well, can I have it longer? And he, you know, the great thing about it, him was he appreciated where he was. And that was what made him so powerful was he, he knew what I did and he didn't try to like kind of try to ask for something different because right. he knew exactly what I, at that point, you know, some people kind of knew what I would, what well, I was. that's artist to artist then. I mean, then he's seeing, he's not like, yeah, yeah, I like the painting, but could you put more black in it? Yeah. It was. Yeah. And then came the, the length of the trouser conversation. Uh -huh. And so I, you know, gently broached the subject and he said, no, I want it exactly like yours. And that was, you know, you know, David Bowie, you know, fully embracing what you do is, was a moment. But I think it's also just to remind people, like, that was an organic moment. That was not something that a publicist or a stylist or anyone is just like, yeah. it was someone seeing yeah. the artistry and being attracted to the, the pureness of it, I think. Yeah, I mean, he was the most amazing person and the most beautifully generous person in regards to that. And that's why in regards to any, you know, high profile person or, you know, celebrity we deal with, it's, us it's usually a mutual respect relationship. And that's what makes it really fulfilling and interesting for all of us because they could go anywhere and they could get anything. And the idea that they actually, you know, I still, when I see people on the street, and I still, like, kind of almost want to go and say hello. Hi. <laughs> My name's in your seat. <laughs> yeah. So it's that, you know, really, you know, because, I, I mean, I've, I, I've, but this think really he's amazing. On the map. It didn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is you with Ralph, as you said, is with Big Mentor. And, uh, when you're at the early CFDA, yeah. is you winning your first CFDA? Oh, right? so young. Ah, oh, so young. <laughs> Look at that handsome guy. And thinner. Uh, <laughs> this is um, one of your big first men shows in Paris. It was my first, yeah. 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 And for me, you know, moving to Paris as an American designer, it was, it was such a big step for me in regards to the profile of what I was doing, because in Paris, it really still does, the profile is bigger. And there was also a business reason too, because you know I, it shows earlier and- There's also the, the, the profile as well as the, and I'm sure we'll get flack for this or I will, but like, Paris is where the artists show, right? I mean, and okay. Well, in America they do too. Said the new president of the CFTA, we'll move on. No, no, <laughs> no, but uh, the, the, no, I agree in regards to that is culturally yeah. it is. Um, but the reason why I took the chairmanship on was because there is so much happening here in America that the world needs to see. And the one thing that America is, it is so amazingly diverse in regards to the talent right. that is, and you don't have that in Europe. So that is something that's so important for people to see. And I went to Paris initially, yes, because it was good for the profile and for the business. And, but I also think it's important to show in New York too, because I think it's important that the world does see that there is true, you know, conceptual artistic ideas happening here as well. Another huge moment for you. Uh, yeah. Michelle Obama, 2000 and, I'm always bad at math, this is 2013. 13. Yeah. Um, on the inauguration day, your dress. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, 
uh, I mean, I was one of five that actually were, was approached to. So I didn't know until I was in Paris and I didn't know until I started getting phone calls. I was in the gym and I was getting phone calls, Tom, get off the treadmill because you have to talk to CNN. <laughs> um, but for me, I, you know, cause I grew up with my sisters and my mother who were the most amazing, strong women. So for me, it was the most amazing way of showing my appreciation for, you know, women. Because she was, there was nobody like her. Uh, oops. Okay, these are, let's, these are when we speak of the shows. This was 2015 uh, or 18? I don't know. Where's Matthew? <laughs> Matt knows. Matt knows. Um, but this was one of my favorite. It was, it was this kind of animal wonderland, beautiful hats with where the story. But again, the photos don't even begin to do it justice because yeah. it was just this dream world of animals, right? Yeah. No, it was also, it was hunters hunting the animals and in the end, the animals won. So in a way that was, it was such a small way of telling a story that for me, you know, the animals win in this story right. as opposed to the hunters. Yeah. So it was, you know, you see the more conceptual and the more grotesque shapes on the hunters. And then you see the beautiful, you know, simple classic ideas with this amazing headpieces and the animals um, were uh, ultimately the ones that prevailed in the end. Okay. This was, was another, I think super important socio-cultural moment. Yeah. LeBron James, when he's over the Cleveland Cavalier, Cavaliers in the playoffs, tell us about this. Well, this came out of a conversation initially, LeBron was a customer for a long time, and then an initial conversation with Dwayne Wade and LeBron in regards to, I always think that, you know, I always think of different ways that I can reintroduce the, the, the tailoring in a way that will, be seen by different people so that they feel like, oh, I guess that's for me as well. And for me, I wanted it to be a real cultural moment in regards to all the young kids that, you know, always see their athletes arriving to, to games and mostly in very unique individual ideas and very flamboyant fashion ideas because athletes, they do love fashion, which is great. And, you know, for me, LeBron was somebody and the, the team as a whole was, was, a, was a group that could tell such an amazingly strong story and put an amazing image in, to those kids that was so much more than fashion, about their clothes. And for me, it was really more a moment that I wanted kids to see that they weren't wanting to look like individually dressed people. They were dressed as a unit. And the power was, I wanted them to represent the strength of themselves as a team, as opposed to on their own. Um, and then it became a huge fashion moment, which was good too, but. <laughs> it's good for business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was tremendous. It's like, you're right to, 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 whether you're 12 or 52, but you're watching them in that pregame, sort of walking through the, the corridor and yeah, like it, seeing all of them together. Yeah. There was a power to that. Power in like, it's important that everyone feels like they can be part of it. Yeah. And that's what I wanted them. I wanted all those young kids to feel like, oh, I guess I could be part of that too. Yeah. And that was important for me. Beautiful. Let's LeBron again. And, um, okay, this is, one of my favorite dresses. This is the Met Gala a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. Cardi B. Yeah. Easy to get in the car with this. <laughs> uh, so here, this is a great example of like, hey, Tom, where does the idea come from? How does this, like, where, and how does it start? And how does it go from Cardi B is going to wear a dress. This is how I see her. And let's start talking with the team. Yeah. I mean, this started before I, I and we even met Cardi because it's really based on something that I had done, I think, a season prior 
from the first women's collection I did in, in Paris. And then, you know, the Met, of course, and the gala of the night, you know, really um, is a moment to, you know, make a statement. You know, of course, I want people to all really go there and, you know, and understand what they're actually going to see, which is Andrew's amazing shows that he, you know, puts on every year um, and spends so much time really re-educating people in regards to the importance of fashion um, and, and elevating fashion to art, which I think Andrew has done the best of anybody in the world. Absolutely. Um, but for me, it was like, I mean, Cardi is Cardi. So she has to be uh, the biggest and the best for the night. And so it wasn't that much thought in regards to how big it was going to be. But it, it became, you know, an amazing commitment on her end. And then, of course, on our end, because the work that went into this was, it was it's a really special piece that was... Um, a moment, but the, but also too, we all, you know, we all wanted to meet her and we wanted to, you know, see what she was like. You see the work that goes into being someone like Cardi B, because she, the times, even like the the thirty minutes she had for fittings was at like three in the morning, and she would be there at three in the morning. And so sometimes the idea, you know, everybody sees Cardi as who she is now, but the work that goes into being her is so, uh, it's exhausting and it's really admirable. And sometimes- She, she might have said the same about you. Well, I don't know about that, but you know, it's the type of thing with her and at her level and LeBron at his level, sometimes you always see the, the, the show piece and you don't see all the work that goes into making that showpiece. And I think that is what, what we, you know, learned and respected about her so much. Let's have another look at it. And she also was playful and she wanted to really, you know, do it. She wanted to go there. And I think that was, you know, fun for us to be you, able to. You can't, because, be, you can't be shy and put that on. Yeah. Right. And, and also, too, it's, it's nice to see, you know, I think it's important for all of us to be open to, like, really putting ideas out there and telling stories that move the needle forward. How long did it take to, to make that dress? It took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Specifics, I have other people that know exactly. <laughs> and it took a little but bit. But it was like 50,000 feathers that were all hand applied and you know so it was a lot of work um and it was like 300 pounds it was so heavy this is katie perry at yeah. the inauguration a couple of years ago there in white yeah good moment and then we end back on the team i want to talk for a moment i mean the cardi b's and the lebrons those are the big moments those are that's now where at the height of Tom Brown, and and, and uh, it's a long way away from hiding with the door locked. Um, and I want to talk for a moment then about, you know, I, Brooke and I always say one of our favorite memories is uh, in terms of how our, our, how proud we are of you is one afternoon we got a text from you and Andrew saying, family dinner tonight, urgent. And we showed up thinking, oh, my God, what's wrong? And uh, should have known because there was a grin on your face. And you said, just want you two to know that tomorrow morning I'm going to announce. What? <laughs> <laughs> that you've sold oh, yeah, yeah. your interest in the company. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> to that very wonderful Italian family, the Zenia yeah. family. Uh, yeah. And for... And I just want to say it because it's a huge accomplishment, $500 million. And that was all, again, I just need to, to, to pause on that because five years earlier, you know, you're thinking about locking the door and never opening it up again. What did that feel like? And what did it mean creatively for you? It, it didn't really change that much. It was, it was a, a validation that I made the right decision in 2009 to not, you know, 
closed. But for me, I, I still feel like we're st there's still so much to do. And I think, you know, in a way, we're still at the beginning that, you know, we have, a, you know, a lot more resources to do things. We have a lot more resources to open new stores and, you know, hire, you know, you know more talented people. So it just, we are really fortunate. And I do, you know, you know, think like somebody was looking out for me because I, it, it happened and thank God it did because there's a lot of really talented people that it doesn't. And sometimes, you know, you can discount just the, just luck coming into play. Um, just, I was, just was very fortunate in things working out. Yeah. But it did, it, the, the stability of that financially does allow, yeah. you know, expansion, opening stores yeah. and the ability to do, yeah. you know, a different level of artistry then, right? Yeah, but I don't, I don't approach it any differently. You know, I really approached it, you know, almost the exact same way as before I was, you know, in 2004 and five when I had my first shows. I always knew that you kind of, you do have to put everything into it. In order for people to see uh, that you're serious about it, you have to really invest in your idea. You can't just almost go halfway in. You have to really dive in. And then I always did that from the beginning. And, you know, you know, it's like I said, you have to love it more than anything else in the world. And you have to just do it because it, you know, there's a lot of people that are in your world that, you know, in a way you're in indirectly, you're in competition with a lot of people and, you know, you have to do it and you have to make sure that you do something that makes people see it and appreciate it and makes it happen. I want to then bring it kind of back full circle for a moment. Notre Dame, what did, when you were here, is there anything that you learned here that you carried forward with you that helped you and still helps you in terms of... Um, success you've achieved? Yeah, I think every, you know, education is always important. I think the most important thing for me is with everybody here now, it's like you should be able to think like you, any one of, you know, and anybody here at Notre Dame now can do anything that they want to do. There shouldn't be any limits to anything because if I did it, you can do it. And, you know, and in a way you look, you know, you know, through the years at people that have done it too. And you think in a way like, well, yeah, I mean, if they did it, why couldn't, you know, you do it or I do it? So it's, it's in a way just being open and letting life, really being open to life, enabling it to all happen. And specifically here at school, I mean, it's just, you know, I think the great thing about Notre Dame is like you're almost in such an amazing place that you feel like everybody cares for you. And, you know, I think, you know, my the years of swimming the, and the, I think the, the rigor and the, just the discipline of a sport helped me, you know, survive and um, do things uh, the way I did, it, did them. Um, so that I think it's the whole package. That really but then there's also the moment when you leave college and you realize they didn't teach you some things. Like, I wish they would have told me that while I was here. Well, I also feel like I left, I went to New York out of college and I realized like, okay, now I have to actually do everything for myself. And so... You're your laundry? <laughs> yeah, I, I had to learn how to do my laundry. And, and actually get every meal for myself. <laughs> um, but in a way, it was life, like, really started. You know, I think it's most important when you're here to absorb everything possible and then leave school and just realize, like, the whole world can be yours. But work hard, and it's not going to happen overnight. And if you're doing it just to be rich and famous, good luck. Because 
most of the time it doesn't happen. And that's why I say success is really just doing something that you love so much and you do it really well. Yeah. I want to be mindful of time and get questions from the audience, but a couple, just a few last notes. Your, your, your father is a very formative. I mean, the suits, even the shoes. Um, any advice from him that still lives in your head? Yeah, always just be true to yourself. I mean, the one thing about my parents, they were always so generous in regards to, you know, exactly like if you're going to do something, just make sure you do it really well. And my father, who I, you know, I do reference fairly often, and he was, he's up there laughing because he, he would get the biggest kick out of thinking like he was any type of inspiration. Um, you know, it was really just being true to yourself. And I think that is what, I know I'm always true to myself. Um, some people who have observed your shows could say, there's a lot of Catholic imagery there. Yeah. Can, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's good to draw on my own personal life <laughs> and play with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you know provoke, you know, different interpretations of things. And I, but but I think it's I raise it not to be provocative, but in, in because it is playing with an idea and it's playing with an image and just like as I always say, like you can look at a Francis Bacon portrait of a Velasquez picture of the Pope and you're playing with the image and what does it spark in the viewer, right? So yeah, I think taking very classic ideas and ideas that everybody thinks that they know and giving it to them in a way that almost drives them crazy because they don't understand why they don't they don't know it that way is interesting and it's fun in a little twisted way <laughs> but i think as a designer that is my job is to really you know put ideas in front of people that start conversations that you know that make make keeps the story going and and also too I just do it you know personally because I need to also you know challenge myself as that in that way as well yeah. are there three words that would describe Tom Brown um, these are the questions he hates oh my god that's why I saved him for the end <laughs> yeah um See? Now, I'd like other people to answer those questions. I knew you were going to yeah. say that. We'll ask, we'll ask Andrew or, or yeah. your, you know, yeah. Pat, uh, your sister later. Um, so uh, I guess my last thought to you is, you know, again, to go back to when we thought what we'd want students to hear, what we didn't hear, what we didn't see role model-wise when we were here. But even now, you know, I hear from uh, people in their 20s and, you know, just coming out of school where they they feel that, you know, um, they might not be in a place where there's the best design program or they might not be, feel they're going to feel like they're going to, you get hired for your credentials and less for your potential. Um, what would you say to them? If you want to do something badly enough, you just do it and figure out how to do it. And recognize that you're going to have to work really hard to do it, especially if you're, you're entering into something that you're not schooled in or you really don't have the, the, the education in. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. Yeah. You, you should think like you, should, you could certainly do it, but I want to do it that badly that I'm going to work my tail off. If someone comes to you and wants to work for you and they're 22, 24, right out of school, yeah. and they're, what are you watching for that's a deal maker? That like, this one's got it, going to make it. And what are you looking for that you're like, oof, get them out of here? Just intelligence and, you know, a hard worker. But what's the deal breaker? Uh, that they want to be in fashion too badly. Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, but tell more. I mean, because they, they, they don't because get it. Then, because they're looking at the glamorous side of it. Right. And, uh, you know, as we all know, anybody that's specifically in fashion, it's not 
for most, most of the time, it's not so glamorous. And, but it is in the way that we, we are so fortunate, we're so, we have the luxury of being able to do beautiful things and tell beautiful stories, but it is so much work to do that. And anybody that just wants the social, you know, fluffy side to it, it's not so interesting to me. Yeah. No patience. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, make time for some questions from the audience. If... Oh. Tom has been extraordinary, generous, and Michael with engaging with students during this residency. So tomorrow on South Quad, there's 45, 50 students who are participating in a football game that's really some kind of performance piece shoot uh, that Tom is leading. And there's a course that we're also doing in the spring that a bunch of students are participating in. And we did videos and auditions for these events. And to a person, the submissions we got from the 150 plus students that engaged with this were, look, I'm a accounting major, I'm a theology major, but this is what I love. And then they would show us dresses that they're making. They would show us art and sketches. They would show us little performance videos and tents. And just to see a vehicle where students can realize they're, they're studying something and developing a discipline here at Notre Dame, but also being able to marry with it these ideas that captivate them. I yeah. mean, this, it's a really unique opportunity. Yeah. We wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to stoke your curiosity. We have time for just a few questions tonight. We've asked some of these students to get us, to kick us off. And so first I'd like to, uh, to ask Luisana, introduce yourself and, and ask your question. And then Tom, and Michael, you guys can field it. Hi, um, hi Mr. Brown, my name is Luisana Gonzalez. Um, um, I'm a senior and I'm an English major. And my question, um, which you, you briefly touched upon, but um, you've stated that in your life and career, following um, this authentic instinct of what you think is beautiful, um, this purity of vision has allowed you longevity and sort of the heart to keep going. So my question is, um, as you move through your career and you're in different contexts, how have you stayed in touch with that original instinct um, and that purity of vision? I think it's, it's very easy to stay in touch with it because it's so much a part of you know, how I live and every day I think we're all reminded by that purity and that original idea because we all live it. And I think that's when I was saying like at the beginning, you know, the most important thing I think for a designer to do is to almost create one thing that you can almost bank everything on. And I think that's what I did at the beginning and that's what we live every day. And, and the, the power in that, um, what I created at the beginning enables us to do so much because people still have that image of what we do in their head in regards to um, what it like truly represents. Which is that, as we said earlier, that it's, it's Coco Chanel with the black jacket yeah. and here a hundred years later, people are like, that's what Chanel is. It's yeah. just, and now it's a version with you and yeah. the gray suit. Yeah. yeah. Which is, you said, as you said, you can scale that and never yeah. stop, right? Yeah. And too many young designers, as you've said, don't think about that. Yeah, I mean, it's like it was. It's so strong in all of our heads that there is that one thing that really fuels everything, and I think it's important to really create something that is is truly yours. Thank you. I should say we're going to start with student questions, but audience members, if you would like to ask questions, we're going to try to get through as many as we as we can before we break. Jean. Claire, you're next. <laughs> uh, hi there, my name is Claire Miller. Uh, I'm a senior and I major in political science and I minor in innovation and entrepreneurship. My question is, is, what is your favorite piece you've ever designed or piece you're most proud of? And are there any pieces you look back on now and would change if given the chance? Mm. Uh, it, uh, everything is important and everything is important in their own way. I probably would remiss if I didn't say the gray suit is 
you know, really the, where it all started and what is ultimately the most important all the time. Um, but I wouldn't, ever, I wouldn't take anything back. I wouldn't redo anything. I, in regards to creating collections, I wouldn't put something out in front of somebody if I almost didn't love it more than anybody else seeing it. So it's, um, yeah, I wouldn't change anything. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aiden O'Brien. Um, I'm a sophomore mechanical engineering student. And my question is, how did the four stripes become the iconic Tom Brown logo as we know it? And how do they inform the wide range of, de of designs in your various collections? Do you see it as restrictive or liberating? Um, well, the, the, the idea of the stripes initially came from just a varsity reference. And um, so I put it on knits and very early on. And it wasn't always four stripes. It was three stripes initially. And then Adidas was very strong in telling me that, <laughs> you know, it'd be nice if you rethought those three stripes. <laughs> um, and what was the second part of the question? Do you see it as restrictive or liberating? I find that everything that I do is liberating. I, I want people to see that, you know, even as kind of as strict and as buttoned up of what I do sometimes, I want it to be looked at as something very liberating for people and that everybody should uh, approach it in a, 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 an easier way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ask, please introduce yourself too before you ask your question. Hello, I'm Alora Lupi. And I was curious if the fashion calendar shrunk down. So right now you do eight shows. If you did four shows, how would that impact your brand as it's built up? Could it be resized so that the whole industry could resize to downsize a bit? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think it's almost a conversation that has been happening for a long time because the calendar is very, it is, rigorous and it, it, there's a lot to do every year. Um, you know, I think it's a personal choice. You can choose to do less, but I love keeping the momentum going and I love challenging ourselves to really, you know, keep those collections and new ideas in front of people all the time. But it is a personal choice. You, you can choose not to. All right, thank you. Thank you. And one quick question. Do you guys offer internships? <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Grace Hamilton. I'm a master's in fine arts student in visual communication design. Um, and my question was, I'm aware of how hard construction is. Um, and I wondered how you, I'm assuming you taught yourself construction and sewing and things like that when you were first starting out. So I just wondered how you did that. I learned everything from Rocco Ciccarelli, who was the tailor I started my collection with. And, you know, Rocco in his very strict, very gentle um, Roman Italian way said, Tom, you'll never be as good a sewer as somebody that grows up, you know, being able to sew. So, you know, in a way, I learned everything from him. And it was a beautiful education in regards to making things really well. But he also did the very conceptual things too. So he was very talented in, in really pushing classic tailoring into a world that was not always so classic. I mean, he would roll his eyes all the time at some of the things that we would do, but he loved it. Three-legged pants. Three-legged trousers, <laughs> yeah. But that three-legged three trouser was as well made as every two-legged trouser. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name's Ian. I'm a junior. I'm studying product design and marketing. Um, and you had mentioned earlier, you were talking about like creative block and how you got through that. Is there any like inspiration you looked for when you were dealing with creative block that like helped you get through it? I, I think every, you know, there would be so many different answers from so many different people. For me, I, you just don't fight it. You know, you have to just trust that it eventually will happen. And I, there's nothing I do to, you know, you just, I don't know, go have a drink. 
I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> uh, maybe I shouldn't. Have He's said a that. junior. Oh, I think you're a junior. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Hi, Tom. I'm Renee. I'm a writer and a tech entrepreneur. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if you could take us back a little bit to those times when you were in L.A. and you were just playing with vintage fashion. Um, did you ever have any, like, a false start where you worked really hard on something, you thought, like, this is it, and then you had to, I mean, it just you set it aside and you had to start over. And, you know, just if you could tell us. Not really a false start, but I did actually want to do something. And I started, you know, really work, you know, doing things with my friend Johnson who designs Libertine and that's his collection. And it, you know, in reality, I just didn't have the money to really do it. So I, I knew I needed to get back to New York and just get a job. And, you know, I went with no money for so long. I just loved having a paycheck coming in. <laughs> so, so in a way that was a little bit of a start stop but there was a reason why, and I was very realistic in regards to why I needed to stop. Thanks. Thank you. Tom, we got one in the balcony. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Drew. I'm a business and design uh, student. And uh, my question to you is, for a college student who's on a budget and wants to look good in a suit, what advice would you give or strategies Ooh. would you give uh, <laughs> to, to, to look good in a suit on a budget? I'm going to go to Michael on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Call him broke. <laughs> uh, well, what I would always say is, you know, it's not about price. It's about how you wear it. Yeah. And it's what we always talked about at GQ is like people get hung up on labels and names and like in real style. It's just like it's not about I've got to have the hottest thing. It's most expensive. It's style comes I mean this most sincerely from in the inside out. So, um, you know, you could, you could kill it with some thrift store stuff and pieces and accessories. And like, I would always, and Brooke, my wife, is always, and many times I'll talk about all the time at GQ, it was like, I didn't grow up with much money, but like, I figured out like, how to do like, you know, get a good pair of shoes, start with that, and a great blazer from like a good secondhand store. And you like build out from there. And, and, um, don't think about what you don't have. Think about what you've got and, and wear it the way you, like, like you own it. Yeah. And invest in something good. Yeah. You don't need a lot. So. Yeah. Like shoes or a great coat that you know you can wear all the time. And then you're known for it. It's your, it's your uniform. So. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luke. I'm a junior from Paris, France. I'm studying international economics. Um, you briefly touched on this, but coming from a creative industry, um, balanced out with, of course, the hard work and the commitment, I was wondering if you could talk about how luck kind of played into building what you've built, um, kind of what form that took and how you see it fitting into the story so far. I mean, I do feel like I was really fortunate in regards to using my instinct in regards to, you know, making important decisions and, and really following my own instinct and not, um, not listening to others um, in a way, you know, it's because I could have, and there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions in regards to through their own experiences that that's how things should be done. I think really, I think understanding the importance of your own instinct because you truly know what, what you want to happen and how you want it to happen and nobody else's experience is that. And I think it is and I think indirectly I think that can be luck in a way. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for just one last question. So you're gonna get the last oh, word. We can do a couple more. No, we, we got a, we got a couple of announcements, <laughs> but thank you. Hi, I'm Gracie. Not I'm in yeah. anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Gracie. I'm a sophomore studying American Studies, Design and Digital Marketing, um, and I want to ask about the uniform. You all look great, by the way. Um, <laughs> what's the process for giving everyone their uniform? Is it like a custom process? Do they get to pick their uniform, or how does that work? <laughs> What is it, guys? <laughs> no, it's it's 
in a way, it's, you know, for me, if you're going to come work in, in this world, you have to really understand why this is and why this exists. And it's really not about the clothing. It's really about creating this, this idea that is growing and becomes more and more important in people's minds because it's this almost piece of living art that people see around the city, around the world. And, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's simple. It's, it's really one thing that can be adapted for, you know, anyone that comes to the company. And, but it's something that's, it, it is really, really important that you, you want to do it. You're not forced to do. Because if you're, if you're doing it because you're having to be talked into it, it really isn't the place to be. Because it's so much more important than, than a job, in a way. Thank you. I wanted to thank all the students especially who were the engine behind this residency, as I mentioned. And for those of you guys who are feeling excited and curious about seeing this work being made live, we do invite you to join us. It might be a little muddy, but from 11 to 1 tomorrow in front of The Rock, there's going to be some interesting Tom Brown, Notre Dame action happening on the South Quad. And so we invite you to come to come witness and participate in it. And we're so excited for the students that are gonna to get to be part of this with us. This is gonna be a year long conversation. And there are other themes about Tom and his work that were introduced tonight that at the Institute, we're gonna be drilling into. How do you turn this into a business empire? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur in an industry like design and in a really creative field? How does that look? How do you ride out the storms? Getting a little bit more interested in what happened in 2009 for Tom and his company. We want to look at this from a lot of different angles, and tonight we just got the tip of the iceberg. There will be other events that the Institute is hosting. Our next big event is about the midterm elections with Carlos Lozada, a columnist from the New York Times, and a panel of very distinguished political science faculty from Notre Dame. So if on Tuesday night you're ripping your hair out, being like, what the heck just happened? On Wednesday night, we're going to supply answers for free for anyone who'd like to attend. <laughs> we also have an absolutely amazing folk singer, Iris Dement, who's going to be coming and sharing her music and her work with us in, the, in February. If you have more questions about events or you want to get more engaged in this conversation with Tom or anything this year, please check out our website. We especially want to thank Michael and Tom and their families and their colleagues who braved the adventurous journey to South Bend, Indiana to help us kind of make this magic this week and throughout this residency. And I do have one act as director of the Institute and as a representative of Notre Dame that I'm, I'm very honored to be able to perform tonight on behalf of the university. I'm no swimmer. I think Tom realized pretty quickly when we started talking in February that LeBron James is about as much as I know about sports and fashion. Um, but I deeply appreciate the art and the discipline and the hard work and the extraordinarily deep dedication that Tom and all of the student athletes pour into making Notre Dame a really distinctive and special place. And it is a tremendous honor for these student athletes to serve in this way and to really hit the highest levels of their sport. In Notre Dame, if you're a varsity athlete, you earn a unique space in the monogram club and you're presented with a letter jacket with Notre Dame's insignia. And only varsity players are given this letter jacket. You have to sign like an affidavit in blood that's certified by the Pope to get access to one of these jackets. Tom earned such a distinction when he was here at Notre Dame as a varsity swimmer. And we heard through the grapevine that maybe your letter jacket could use a little updating. It's very, very hard. Talk about it. hard to buy Christmas gifts for. Very hard to get a fashion piece for your fashionable guest. But tonight, I am very thrilled on behalf of the University of Notre Dame and the Institute for Advanced Study to present you with such an update. Oh. So Notre Dame is honored oh. to be part of your story Thank with you. the clothes and all. We hope you'll wear it at least once with pride. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys and have a great night.